those that stay like this for at least 13 grams. Yeah. <laughs> they are this way, you know? They want to come from the back. <laughs> you see? All of them is worth <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. I think we can start. So, uh, welcome to this session about hydrology applications, uh, the last session of this workshop. I am Yolanda Patruno, I'm an Earth Observation Engineer at ESA, ESRIN, and I will chair this session together with Philippe Ayou from the University of Bordeaux. <laughs> so, um, welcome to everybody. Um, I think we can start with the first presentation. Thank you, and welcome to the most interesting and crowded session of the week. I see the karaoke did some uh, damages yesterday evening. Uh, we're going to start with uh, the first talk by, uh, it's not easy to say, Bogapurapu Narayanarao. I hope it's correct. And he's going to tell us about the comparison of soil moisture retrieval models using polarimetric SAR. Next, back to oh, okay, your sure. slide move, and there's either a laser pointer okay. or this one. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. And you've got 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, first of all, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for pronouncing my name correctly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very hard, I get it. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I'm here to present uh, a work done by a master student. So, yeah. I get, uh, we all heard from Costas the other day that how hard it is to get them work, <laughs> master students. So <clears throat> before going into the talks, the comparison of soil moisture uh, retrievals uh, using polarimetric uh, SAR data. So let's see what soil moisture or the permittivity, because in, uh, in SAR domain, we often use the permittivity more often than the soil moisture, because uh, the SAR signal is uh, sensitive to the, the dielectric and the geometries, and the permittivity and the moisture are directly correlated. So, so what is soil moisture? So soil moisture is uh, unsaturated, uh, uh, the water content in the unsaturated soil. So if we consider soil as a three-phase medium, so with the uh, air, water, and soil particles, so this is how it looks like in a cross-section, and if you take a longitudinal section of the soil moisture, uh, the, the soil profile, uh, so in a normal agricultural scenario, so this talk mostly uh, focuses on the soil moisture applications in uh, croplands towards the agricultural applications. So the soil moisture, what we define in remote sensing, is uh, different from the soil moisture, what the hydrologist says, because uh, we actually consider the top few centimeters of the, the average of the top few centimeters because we can only observe from the top uh, um, whatever it is there, irrespective of the vegetation cover or the organic layer. But in terms of uh, hydrology, the soil moisture is uh, only after this O origin, only contained in, uh, contained in the mineral soil. So, in remote sense, uh, there are uh, two major ways to represent this, and a volumetric or the by ratio of mass, but in remote sensing, we mostly use the volumetric notation because of its simplicity and, al as always, uh, and also the more applications in the hydrology. In the context of cropland, why it is important? So uh, <coughs> if you observe at a field scale, so the soil moisture is actually critical for the crop growth dynamics and also the yield and production. And if you and last, the scale. So if you talk about a bigger scale and bigger picture, so the soil moisture indirectly affects the global food security. Uh, this is kind of in context of crop lines. So <clears throat> using polarimetric SAR, so using basic uh, radar data, the uh, earlier studies dates back from uh, in early 1970s. So uh, the researchers found a direct uh, correlation and linear relationship between the, back, uh, the radar backscatter and the soil, soil moisture content. So there are two major factors, one of the, uh, the target and the sensor, uh, the, uh, the sensor and the target parameters which influence this backscatter. So here is a simulation of uh, uh, how the target, uh, the, uh, the sensor parameters, such as frequency, uh, incidence angle, and the polarization affects the backscatter from a bare soil. However, in a real scenario, uh, the soil is not always a bare soil because we have always a vegetation cover, almost 60% of land is covered by vegetation. So, in specific to the uh, cropland, so there are three major factors. The, uh, the one is the vegetation cover and the surface roughness, and the third one is the soil moisture. 
So <clears throat> the problem here is the first major one is the vegetation cover. So here we have a real, real scenario. So we have to go from the left to the right after removing the vegetation cover. We're left with two parameters. So this could be done using uh, several methods. Uh, one of such is the decomposition. So since we, uh, so in polarimetry, we have a second order uh, polarimetric coherence, uh, coherence matrix. So in a three component decomposition framework, so we can actually divide uh, the decomposed uh, observatory matrix into a surface, dihedral, and a volume scattering mechanism. So <clears throat> if we, uh, so, uh, in a loose sense, so the, vegeta the, major the majority of the contribution from the vegetation uh, goes to the, uh, can be represented as a volume. So if we can detect that vegetation, so that, uh, uh, that uh, we can get at other uh, di dihedral and the surface component. So in this study, we have done that using um, a generalized eigenvalue uh, decomposition using a, a, a volume model to represent the vegetation based on the criteria proposed in uh, Yamaguchi. So. <clears throat> So this method uh, ensures that uh, you will uh, uh, detect the maximum amount of volume um, to retain the other information. So after getting, after removing the volume, so since uh, still we have uh, two more, uh, two more components in the residual matrix, which is the uh, the, the, the double bounds and the surface scattering. So. Again, we, we will uh, take the first dominant scattering and we check for if it is uh, major, major, majorly uh, closely related to the surface. Uh, that I will tell you later, like how we are actually discriminating whether it is a surface or not. So then we can actually model the surface using uh, 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 available surface scattering models. One of such is the XBRAG, the most popularly used for the soil moisture studies. So which. <clears throat> So we can write a polarimetric coherence matrix of XBRAG as a function of incidence angle, um, uh, dielect uh, dielectric, uh, the permittivity, and also uh, the roughness uh, representing factor, the azimuthal uh, slope, or the orientation. So <clears throat> if we generate um, a sensitivity plot for the XBRAG uh, scattering model for uh, different scattering mechanisms, so how they are varying with the permittivity, incidence angle, and the surface roughness, uh, the first one shows the cloud average alpha, how it, um, with, uh, the x-axis is the permittivity, y-axis is the alpha, the average alpha, and the color shows the soil, uh, the roughness representative factor xi. So the second one is the recently proposed theta FV. Um, we have also seen the, uh, the, import, uh, the, actual, uh, the effectiveness of the theta FP in uh, burnt area index by uh, uh, Dr. Day. So here, uh, the major observation here from these uh, two plots, we can see that the theta is uh, less affected by the, uh, the azimuthal slope uh, so that we can have a much more reliable uh, uh, estimates even in presence of the surface roughness. So, if we take a look at in a more familiar H alpha plot, um, if we plot a similar H theta for the XBRAG here, so here we can clearly see that uh, uh, for the same dielectric and uh, different roughness values, we have a wide range of alpha. However, if we see for the theta, it is almost uh, uh, linear and the, the effect is minimum. So <clears throat> the methodology, the flowchart goes uh, like this. So we have observed uh, polarimetric uh, uh, pulsar data, and we extract the T3, and we decompose and extract the dominant surface scattering. And one more advantage of this method is um, we can apply the equal, uh, equivalently for the full pole and the compact pole as well, because the parameter theta can be equivalently derived from a, a full pole T3 or the uh, compact C2. And after getting the first dominant, uh, the first dominant uh, scattering matrix, uh, coherence matrix, we can actually check for whether, it, uh, whether the pixel really belongs to us uh, close to a surface or not with a simple threshold of the theta. Uh, then we can, extra, uh, we can estimate the soil permittivity uh, using uh, uh, the first dominant surface uh, scattering uh, matrix. So uh, to, in order to test this algorithm, so we chose the data, we have, uh, selected the data set from the SMAPX12 campaign, which is collected by our Manitoba and uh, with a UV uh, L-band sensor. So, so at, at a test case, we have actually tested over uh, first over uh, canola crop. So uh, the data kind of comprises the uh, belongs to the phenology stage between um, uh, flowering to the early vegetation stage. So here we can clearly see the effect of uh, removal of volume uh, in a H alpha plot that the entire cluster shifted to a more volume scattering towards the surface and a dihedral mix. So. <clears throat> 
Even we can also observe the, ent the entropy is also reduced from 0.77 uh, to 0.5 and, uh, and a, a reduction in the alpha as well. Coming to the permittivity estimates, uh, so if you see that, so in the scatter plots on the right here, so <clears throat> because of the um, sensitivity of the alpha towards um, the azimuthal slope, uh, we can, uh, the, the ambiguity between um, uh, distribution uh, between two azimuthal uh, slope or the roughness values. So alpha actually overestimated uh, some of the values that too towards, uh, we can also see that uh, towards incre uh, with increase in the permittivity, the uncertainty is also increasing. However, with the theta, although there is an increasing uncertainty, the uh, results are much more better and uh, uh, significantly uh, better compared to the alpha. Uh, further from this time series plot, the, uh, we can clearly see that uh, 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 during the early vegetation uh, stage, the uncertainties in the estimates are low, and uh, as we go and uh, vegetation towards the flowering stage, the uncertainties are higher, representing there is more uh, contribution from the vegetation canopy, and which is uh, intrinsically, I mean, which is difficult to segregate even using the decomposition. So. Why permittivity, why not soil moisture? So we can actually convert the permittivity using uh, several dielectric mixing models to a soil moisture. However, in order to, before converting that, we just uh, take a look at uh, how actually field data and a simple, uh, more popular empirical fit uh, actually performs uh, in converting soil permittivity. So this is the field data, the blue dots, and the red line is the, is the empirical model proposed by TOPE. Uh, <coughs> here we can clearly see that uh, up to a, a, a uh, permittive values of 10 and 50 in the value perform, uh, the model performs good, uh, but as we increase the permittivity, there is, a, there is a, a strong uncertainty and the deviation from the word. So we need much more complex models to actually uh, uh, convert the permittivity into the soil moisture. Uh, therefore, we actually st uh, stick to only estimation of permittivity and we just uh, leave the, uh, uh, the flexibility of the users to convert the permittivity into uh, the soil moisture on the, with the availability of the ancillary data like soil structure information and other things. <clears throat> so in order to compare this with uh, uh, popularly available uh, soil, uh, uh, soil moisture estimation models, uh, so these are basically the surface scattering models to, uh, which are uh, empirically derived to estimate, derived estimate uh, the soil moisture specifically. So one popular model is proposed by Dubais and others, which basically uses uh, the two copal uh, backscattering intensities um, as a function of the surface roughness, wavelength, and the incidence angle. So if you plot this copal ratio to the VV, so it is mostly a linear relationship between uh, copal and the increase in, um, increasing the permittivity or the surface roughness. So whereas in o, um, the model proposed by O in uh, 2004, this is an improve, improved version because there are like three, two more versions for the O. O model proposed, uh, the soil moisture model uh, from, proposed by O. Here that is uh, the, uh, yeah, the relationship between the copole and cross pole is much more nonlinear. And also these are mostly valid over bare soils and up to some sparse vegetation conditions that we will see now. How. Uh, so we have done a preliminary study over three crops with these three models. So pasture, soybean, and corn. <clears throat> As we can see that there are significant underestimation in the surface scattering model, which is expected because uh, um, this actually underpins the importance of vegetation correction while estimating uh, soil moisture over vegetative terrains, even though the uh, even low biomass conditions. So once we correct for the vegetation, I, uh, we can clearly see that uh, there is a significant improvement uh, in the uh, estimates with uh, RMSE ranging from uh, uh, 5 to 6, uh, 6.7 for all these uh, three different crops. And there is another uh, difference if we compare the results from the uh, first row and the second row. Uh, uh, obviously, we can see that there is a significant under, underestimation in the model proposed by Du Bois compared to the O, which is because uh, this linear appro approximation of this model, uh, with the increase of the vegetation, the copal ratio will increase, and uh, it um, uh, and and also there is a, there will be a significant overestimation of this roughness factor, which underestimates the soil moisture here. So, whereas in uh, O model, if we see that the slope of this. Uh, uh, the copal ratio to the increase in the uh, uh, roughness, uh, uh, the copal ratio to increase in the roughness, it actually saturates and tend to uh, get, uh, 
reaches unity so that it won't, it will do uh, it will go for a less underestimation compared to the uh, compared to the du bois model so which we can uh, which we also observed in the results so <coughs> And as in a qualitative perspective, so we can also, uh, we also derived uh, uh, spatial and temporal soil permittivity maps across uh, for the entire scene for the uh, different dates. So here we can clearly see the, uh, the red represents the lower soil permittivity and blue represents the corresponds to the higher one. And here on the right, we can see the, uh, the rainfall data and field measured soil, uh, soil permittivity information. So, Clearly, we can clearly see that uh, during initial uh, days, uh, the, the, soil, uh, the soil permittivity is higher, and uh, with the time, we can also see a quasi-exponential uh, quasi decay, which is uh, normal in case of the soil moisture. And again, after a rainfall event uh, towards the end, we can clearly see an uh, increase in the soil permittivity. Yeah. So coming to the summary, uh, so since it's a preliminary study to actually compare uh, different soil moisture uh, uh, estimation models using a polarimetric SAR. So in this study, we actually presented a methodology which is generic for both polar, uh, full and compact pole, uh, compact pole observation uh, uh, SAR data. So we have evaluated this technique um, over different crops with uh, two, uh, on a, two major, uh, major phrenology stages. And we, uh, uh, with the theta, we observed that the uh, RMSs are better compared to the previous one, although this claim, we, we may not say that this is actually, um, uh, it, yeah, this is a big claim that compared to the bare surface models with a vegetation correct, corrected uh, proposed methodology, so it, uh, the, there is a need for more comprehensive evaluation of the proposed methodology with the other decomposition techniques uh, after correcting the vegetation. <coughs> but coming to the advantages of the proposed uh, uh, framework, so. Uh, we have also seen that from the simulations and as well as the um, results that there is a minimum effect of azimuthal slope or the surface roughness on the soil moisture uh, retrieval. And further, we, uh, the computations are fast enough because we only uh, rely on the 1D minimization rather than a 2D H alpha uh, minimization. And which is also generalized for both, uh, both the full and compact poles, so we can use uh, depending upon the mode of the data available. So. <coughs> In this study, uh, we have only considered the surface scattering model, the XBRAG. Similarly, we can also ca consider the extended Fresnel's um, scattering model for the second component, second dominant component with depolarizing effect, so that we, we can improve the rate of inversion, which we can see that in the previous uh, qualitative slide, some missing pixels. Uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions up there. Yes, Costas. Get the mic. I think I need this. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah, I'm not sure if I follow exactly how you are coming to the surface component. So, ah. so you, you, you have a volume component, and then you remove it from a rank 3 T matrix. And then why do you have, first of all, a rank 2 matrix? Uh, so if you go to slide six, maybe, yeah, sure. or, or we're going to reduce what we... <clears throat> Sorry for this. No, it's okay, it's okay. No, it's not working there. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, there we are. One more. Yep. Yes, here. here. So yeah. wh why T prime is a rank two matrix? That's I, the first question, yes? So why, sorry, I didn't. T prime, T prime should be in theory a rank three matrix. Uh, no, it's rank two, yes. And then also you assume that you have then a surface scattering component, which is rank one. Yes. And you invert with x brac, which is higher than rank one. x brac is not x rank is one. Rank, uh, yeah, full rank matrix, yes. Exactly. So yes. I don't understand. And then what you assume to be the second one? First of all, surface scattering, you assume everywhere roughness. So you assume that it's by itself not rank one. 
why yeah. you invert the rank one matrix? Yeah, if then? I get your question correctly, so we are in, uh, inherently uh, comparing a rank one with a rank three output, right? Yes. So we have actually did a rank three versus rank three comparison as well um, by introducing a rotational component uh, for this observed uh, first dominant scattering. Uh, so 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 we got this. Um, rank one surface scattering. So we actually uh, used another minimization technique to actually get a rank three uh, by, uh, the, by rotating this and getting for the, all the orientation angles. However, the result seems to be works fine with a rank one since, I mean, the question is actually unsolved. Like, why rank one? Because rank three, uh, even though we are actually uh, doing uh, with an let us say with an azimuthal slope uh, from um, ranging from 0 to 45, and if we rotate this matrix and integrated it, and to generate multiple rank uh, three matrices and minimize and pick up a best one, that's how we did uh, initially. Uh, well, it doesn't seem to produce a nice results, though it is logically correct and seems to be, but this rank one actually given us the best results, so we have had to solve that issue, the rank issue, yes. But you obtain biased results if you invert x brac just by using the, the rank one approximation, because x brac is exactly what this is doing. Okay. So, so you, you correct just brac then. And my quest, second question is, uh, you assume that you have a dihedral and a surface component, and, but you cannot separate them. They are ambiguous. How do you separate these two components? Oh. Actually, we, that's why we kept a threshold on the theta, the scattering type parameter itself, so that to actually, uh, because it can be dihedral or surface, the first one. Uh, so in order to uh, get a valid pixel, to, if it is more surface only, then only we invert for the soil permittivity. So we kept a threshold of 30 degrees theta to actually mask out the actual dihedral dominance. So that's the next part of it, the future work, so to include the dihedral component as well to actually improve the rate of inversion. And how do you fix the threshold? Oh, the threshold actually, if, um, I have a slide for the backup slide. So, uh, if we actually plot uh, that um, for a uh, the canonical target, the theta values, so there will be a point of inflection at uh, I think roughly 20, uh, 31 point something of the theta, where the entropy goes up till that, and entropy goes down from there. So. If you see that, that inflection point, we actually consider it as a more representing the uh, greater, the, the greater, I mean, the larger values are towards the surface with our low entropy, uh, and the higher entropy values are more towards the uh, dihedral scattering. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Kostas, for the questions. Um, is there any other, maybe short questions? Otherwise, I have one for you. Uh, I have a question for you. <laughs> Just one short question. Uh, you, all your, your comparison work is based on uh, permittivity measurements, the electric constant measurements on the field, I guess. Yes. How, how, you know how they did that? What kind of system do they use yeah, to they, measure the dielectric yeah, constant? Yeah, they have actually used the TDR probes and they actually used um, this uh, um, the calibration equations for each soil type. So okay. this is the like from the TDR and calibrated permitted it, It's a pure surface moisture measurements, or they take some samples of soil and make some measurements in depth, or? No, uh, it's at a five, it is at a five centimeter depth. Uh, they actually took uh, the core samples as well, and okay. also the field measurements, yes. Okay, and then they kind of average the yeah. dielectric concept. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So I think Okay. It's not India, it's Canada. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, I think we can move to the next presentation. Physics-based machine learning and polarimetric surface soil moisture retrieval given by Lorenzo Papali. Good morning, everyone. And I'm Lorenzo Giuliano Papale, PhD student at Tor Vergata University of Rome. And today I'm presenting my current research. And before starting, I want to thank uh, Professor Fabio Del Frate, my supervisor, 
and Professor uh, Leila Guerriero and Giovanni Schiavon from Tor Vergata University, and also Jean Bouchard from the Catholic University of uh, Louvain. So um, let's start with the motivation behind uh, this work. Um, and uh, to let you understand uh, the um, uh, to let you understand uh, the, the proposed methodology, I want to start from the title. So from the, the last part on, from soil moisture retrieval, so we know how uh, that soil moisture is a key parameter for agricultural uh, applications, especially we, for precision farming and, uh, um, and the smart irrigation. And uh, uh, SARP data can help a lot in understanding uh, um, the uh, understanding and analyze these, uh, these uh, biophysical parameter. Uh, however, uh, as uh, explained uh, my colleague, uh, the last speaker, the, um, when observing uh, uh, agricultural field, we are observing a complex target, uh, so composed by the soil and the, uh, and the vegetation structure, uh, which is changing in, uh, in time. So SAR polarimetry can help in distinguish the uh, different scattering uh, um, mechanisms. So for this research, uh, uh, we adopted the SAR polarimetry to extract the soil-related components and then to uh, assess the sensitivity of these components to, uh, to the soil moisture. So um, basically nothing new, uh, but in this case we adopted a machine learning approach and uh, particularly an artificial neural network but uh, uh, due to the, to the um, lack of reference data in the, uh, for, uh, concerning this topic, uh, we adopted uh, um, an electromagnetic model uh, to generate an uh, um, extensive data set uh, associating uh, the total backscatter and uh, the, its, uh, its components. Uh, so uh, this is why we call it a physics-based machine learning approach. So uh, the objectives uh, are the following. Uh, first of all, to generate uh, a simulated data set uh, with the Tor Vergata electromagnetic mod model, then to assess the sensitivity to soil moisture of the total uh, um, backscatter and the, uh, and the soil uh, components, the simulated ones, and uh, then to train uh, with the simulated data um, an artificial neural network to separate the scattering contributions, uh, starting from uh, uh, a set of simulated uh, Mueller matrices, and to test uh, this, uh, uh, this model on simulated data to evaluate the performances. Then uh, we applied this uh, um, trained model to real SAR data, in particular the ISA Belsar 2018 uh, dataset. Uh, so thank you, ISA, for uh, providing us this uh, uh, complete uh, and very useful dataset. And uh, to assess the sensitivity to, uh, to soil moisture of the measured total backscatter back and comparing it with the sensitivity con by considering uh, the soil related contribution, surface uh, and double bound scattering mechanism. So uh, let's start from the model. I already introduct, uh, uh, introduced this uh, model on Wednesday uh, during my last talk. Uh, but uh, basically it is based on uh, the uh, radiative transfer theory applied to discrete uh, uh, scatterers with simple shapes with our, uh, that are uh, disc and cylinders uh, with specific properties which are input to the, to the, to the, to the, mo to the model. And uh, the model takes as, in, takes as input also uh, sensor configuration uh, such as the signal frequency, the incidence angle, and the polarization, and uh, the soil properties, uh, uh, so the soil moisture and soil, rough, soil roughness. And then the vegetation is subdivided into infinitesimal uh, layers, uh, and the matrix doubling algorithm is applied to um, model the interactions between uh, the thin uh, sublayers uh, and then between the three main layers, uh, uh, which are represented here in these uh, in these uh, representations. So this is an example of the output of the uh, of the model. Uh, in this case, is uh, we just fixed the soil configuration and the soil uh, um, the soil parameters. Uh, and this is, uh, these are just uh, three linear polarization, but the model is fully polarimetric, so it works uh, with uh, any incidence and scattering polarization. 
And as you can see, uh, the model provides the backscatter evolution, uh, the total uh, backscatter, but also its uh, components, the volume, the double bounce, uh, and the soil when the, um, while the plant uh, is growing. So we, um, we performed a, a preliminary sensitivity analysis on this uh, simulated data set to motivate um, our, our work and uh, to be sure that the sensitivity to soil moisture was higher when considering the soil-related component uh, with respect to the total backscatter. And uh, this is true for the three polarizations. Uh, a Pearson correlation coefficient uh, is uh, uh, every time is higher when considering the soil component. Now uh, let's introduce the uh, machine learning model. Uh, in this case, uh, it is an artificial neural network uh, which takes as input uh, the 16 uh, elements uh, um, which compose the Mueller matrix uh, here represented in the bottom right uh, corner from uh, the Ula Bien Long book. And uh, the, the model has a hidden layer composed by 12 uh, nodes uh, and uh, um, the output of, of, the, of the model uh, are uh, nine and are the backscatter coefficient in the three linear polarization for total backscatter, um, double bounce and not attenuated soil. So after uh, um, the uh, pre-processing uh, procedure and training procedure, we tested the, uh, this model uh, on simulated data. So uh, from the testing uh, in, the, in the three polarization, we see that for uh, total backscatter and the not attenuated soil, the, um, the estimated and the original uh, values uh, are in good agreement uh, and also for double bounce, so, but uh, with a little bit of dispersion for uh, low values uh, of backscatter. But in any case, we have a root mean square error of uh, um, less than uh, one uh, dB. And this is the uh, same example of uh, before, I showed you before, but now with the estimated components which are represented with dashed lines. Uh, we see that uh, the model uh, overestimates a little bit uh, the soil component, which is the pink, uh, the pink line, and uh, underestimates a little bit the, the, total, uh, the total component, uh, the total backscatter, and now um, I, we are investigating why the model uh, um, uh, works in this way. So now I want to introduce the real SAR data set, the, the Isabel SAR 2018 data set, uh, which includes an airborne mission and a field campaign. So the airborne mission was, uh, uh, took place during 2018 over a test site uh, located in Belgium. And uh, it provides Alban fully polarimetric radar acquisitions uh, during a series of five uh, uh, flights. And along with each uh, of these uh, flights, uh, vegetation and soil related variables were collected uh, over corn and wheat uh, fields. But for this study, we selected just five uh, corn uh, fields uh, uh, that are represented here in this map. So concerning the, um, the SAR data processing, basically the uh, data, set, data set provides already processed by MetaSensing BV uh, um, calibrated single look complex focused SAR data uh, in ground range with a sampling uh, distance, ground sampling distance of one meter. So we combined uh, the, uh, the real part and the imaginary part in the, for polarization to compute the Mueller matrix uh, elements, and then we ingested the, the field geometries uh, to, to obtain the averaged Mueller matrix uh, over each field uh, for each flight. And here, uh, concerning the in-situ data, um, I just wanted to show you the distribution of data. So we, we have a uh, uh, plant height coming from 50 centimeters to three uh, meters, and uh, a soil moisture coming from uh, about 4% to 18%, which is uh, not a very large uh, soil moisture range. And these uh, are the preliminary results. Uh, first, of all, first of all, we compared the estimated total backscatter with the ones uh, uh, measured in, during the Belsar uh, campaign. 
and uh, we can see from this scatter plot, uh, scatter plot on the left that uh, the, um, the results are in good agreement. Uh, basically, the values follow the same dynamic, but uh, um, we have uh, um, a lot of dispersion. So uh, we decided to, co to consider for the following sensitivity analysis uh, in uh, involving the, the, the backscatter contributions just that points that uh, uh, were well estimated by the artificial neural network to not introduce, uh, uh, to mitigate the introduction of errors in, uh, in the following analysis. And so we obtained the scatter plot on the right. This, uh, uh, is, um, this slides, it's about the, sen the preliminary sensitivity analysis uh, we uh, performed considering the measured to total backscatter against uh, the estimated uh, not attenuated soil uh, contribution, uh, which is the red line, and the, um, and the double bounce contribution, which is uh, in pink. And we can observe that for HH, uh, the soil and double bounce uh, uh, contribution seems to be more correlated to soil moisture than the total uh, backscatter. For uh, the cross polarization, uh, the, the double bound seems to be the uh, most correlated with a significant uh, uh, correlation uh, with respect to the other two. Um, and uh, for VV polarization, the double bounce again is uh, significant, significantly correlated, and uh, the soil uh, is less correlated, but uh, more correlated than the total backscatter, which seems to be uh, not sensitive at all. And uh, then uh, we applied uh, Pauli decomposition uh, to uh, compare the uh, surface and the edal uh, scattering contributions uh, with uh, the estimated uh, contributions. And uh, as a result, uh, the surface component should to be um, not really sensitive to soil moisture variations. And on the, on the other hand, uh, the dihedral scattering component, uh, uh, which is uh, colored in uh, yellow, uh, show neg a negative correlation. So to conclude, uh, uh, this study aims at highlighting the uh, potentiality of the synergic use of uh, machine learning and electromagnetic uh, modeling for uh, SAR polarimetry applications. And um, the, the preliminary results suggest that uh, the estimated soil-related uh, uh, contributions can be useful uh, for soil moisture retrieval applications. Uh, however, the total backscatter is not properly estimated, as we've seen for the scatter plot, uh, probably due to the fact that uh, to apply a machine learning model to real data, but uh, trained with simulated data, is challenging, so we need to, um, to play a bit to calibrate the model and uh, play a little bit with the hyperparameters of the artificial neural network. And then uh, the poly de decomposition show to be less sensitive to soil moisture if compared to the estimated soil-related uh, scattering contributions. And concerning the future works, uh, we want to adopt the same procedure using space-borne uh, SAR data. We want to try to include the soil roughness uh, as a pa an input parameter for the artificial neural network uh, to uh, fix uh, a soil, uh, this soil parameter and focus just on uh, soil moisture variation. And to add also physical constraints to the artificial neural network to, um, to separate the contributions uh, in a more reliable way so that the sum of, uh, of all the contributions uh, is always equal to the total. And uh, um, to train the artificial neural network uh, for soil moisture uh, um, retrieval algorithm to validate the proposed methodology. And uh, last but not least, to compare the uh, estimated contributions uh, with the result of other polarimetric decompositions. So this was my last slide. Again, I want to thank the uh, Isabel Sartuta um, 2018 uh, campaign team for collecting uh, this amazing data set. Uh, and also I want to thank the, uni the, the Catholic University of Louvain, especially Jean Bouchard for uh, supporting me in the data processing uh, procedure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lorenzo, for your presentation. Are there questions from the audience?
Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, in one of your slides, I saw that you were regressing uh, from the KNU elements to the covariance, uh, sorry, to the sigma elements, right? Sorry, from the? In, uh, from KNU or Mueller elements to your yeah. sigma uh, elements, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, I was just wondering, let's say if I, uh, if I just make the uh, KNU or Mueller matrix in terms of uh, my covariance matrix, which is C, let's say your uh, KNU matrix, you can always represent it in terms of a covariance matrix also. Uh, your KNU is 4 cross 4, you can also represent it in terms of a 3 cross 3 uh, covariance matrix with the elements of the covariance matrix. And in this case, what may happen that if I just make some combination of the KNU elements, then I can directly get the C11, C22, C33. They are also almost close to your sigma uh, values. So why we are, uh, I mean, why you are interested to go through a neural network perspective where, where you have a weight concept coming inter in between? We can just directly use the elements of the KNU matrix and we just combine it in some way that we are getting the C elements, which are also closely related to C sigma H, H, sigma VV, sigma H, H, VV, something like this. So uh, basically you're asking me why I'm applying a machine learning model to obtain the components from the Mueller matrix, right? Obtain the sigma components from the Mueller matrix because if I make the uh, Mueller matrix with in terms of my covariance matrix elements, then also I can get directly the sigma values. The, the fact is that uh, we, we want to exploit the machine learning uh, uh, capabilities uh, to find uh, inside the uh, elements uh, of the of the Mueller matrix uh, and the um, and the um, the relationships between uh, all of, all the elements composing the matrix uh, to find uh, the some features that are related to different scattering mechanism so it's just uh, a different way to to do it and you talked about also the covariance matrix ma matrix uh, we can also use the covariance matrix. In that case, uh, the algorithm uh, could be different uh, since uh, we have to deal with the complex numbers uh, while with the, 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 the Mueller matrix, uh, we are just uh, real numbers. Uh, but uh, mm, yes, in this, with this uh, methodology, we want to exploit the machine learning capability to separate the, all the contributions. Okay, thank you. Question, please. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation. Um, I've known some work that we've done in the past that uh, using machine learning approach can be a uh, computationally um, uh, intense process. How compared to like compared to other methodologies? Uh, once you kind of got everything more or less set up, I know there's a lot of work to get to this point to actually run the neural network, how, how much computation time did it take? Was it a days, weeks, months? And how would this work? Do you think it has potential to work in truly unknown conditions, like you have no um, ground data to compare with? Uh, sorry, concerning the first uh, question, I don't know if I, get, uh, if I got it. Uh, if it's, uh, um, you mean the comprehension behind uh, the machine learning algorithm, so what we can understand uh, from, the, from it? Oh, once you started, got your pipeline in place. How you know? How long did it take to run it through? And, and ah, to it? run the yeah. to to train the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. No, no, the the the, the algorithm uh, to train the artificial neural network. Uh, um, maybe just less than a, than one hour for this uh, uh, this data set. Of, of course, uh, these are simulated data set. Uh, we. Uh, can uh, compute uh, a very huge uh, uh, data set uh, by increasing uh, the interval uh, and the, sam uh, the, the, the sampling of uh, soil roughness and soil moisture to uh, cover uh, um, a large amount of combinations. But in this case, uh, uh, the training procedure uh, uh, duration was less than, uh, than an hour. And to apply this, uh, this procedure is very, very fast. So the, the, once the, the model is trained to apply it uh, is uh, just very fast. Of course, in this case, uh, we were uh, 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 working with the uh, um, average value for each field, not pixel by pixel. So uh, when, uh, of course, when we uh, consider a pixel by pixel uh, um, 
approach, uh, the time uh, is increasing. But I think uh, that uh, when uh, the, the, the artificial neural network is already trained, just by applying it, uh, it's not so time consuming. And um, do you think this has an uh, application where you don't have a simulated data set to, kind of, um, board, to bring into it? Where you had to, you had to rely on the, the, uh, your simulated data set to go with your real data set? Yeah, basically, uh, we need to use simulated data set because we have not uh, a ground through for the scattering contributions. What we want to do uh, now is to consider all the, uh, the time series also in terms of plant height evolution and soil moisture evolution to see, uh, but just for a qualitative uh, assessment to see uh, the behavior of the components uh, uh, it, when compared to plant height uh, variations uh, and soil moisture variations. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So, sorry, but I, we, we could, you can talk during the coffee. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. We, we uh, make it fast because yes, we, we are Thanks for the presentation, very nice. Yeah. Uh, you <laughs> said uh, soil moisture is sensitive to double bonds. And uh, what uh, double bonds means HH is good. But uh, Nicholas mm. Baghdadi says VV is good. I don't know. <laughs> See, now confusion, when, why it is sensitive to double bonds? So you mean... You what mean, contest, what crop, what uh, soil, uh, rough soil, uh, like that. that. Just I want to... Physical interpretation of double bonds, more sensitive to soil much. Okay, so you mean that in this uh, comparison, the total backscatter, uh, the um, DVH... Uh, is uh, the uh, is represented not so very well if compared to the other polarization, but when we see the sensitivity analysis, it seems that the VH, uh, the double bounce, uh, is the more correlated, right? Is this the point? So I think that uh, uh, after the this, let's call it correction of the scatter plot, just taking the well estimated total backscatter. We, uh, um, we deleted this uh, bias in uh, uh, performing uh, uh, not best uh, um, estimation in this cross polarization. So at the end, I think that uh, all the three polarization are uh, comparable. So in this case, uh, it showed uh, a, um, a, a great uh, uh, a, a great correlation, a great sensitivity, and I think it's, uh, it, it, it can be due to the fact that uh, these talks of the, of, the, um, of, the, of the corn plants uh, are oriented, uh, are not uh, perfectly uh, perpendicular, so uh, they can uh, trigger the polarizing effects. Okay, thank you. So we should move to the next uh, speaker. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So this is Cathy uh, uh, Unmesh. Is he here? Okay. You're going you're to make the presentation for him? Okay. Yeah, he is not here, so I will do the presentation. Okay, thank you so much. So it's about uh, polarimetric decomposition techniques, and we're going to hear about machine learning modeling again for soil moisture retrieval using uh, NASA East Row Elbon data. Yeah, okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, uh, the presenter is not, uh, couldn't uh, deliver his talk here because of, I think, postponing of the rescheduling of his presentation, so I'll be just giving on their behalf. Well, I may not know much about the, idea or the actual nature of the, I mean, the, the actual work they did, but I'll try. So... <clears throat> So as we have seen, the, um, the potential application of the machine learning and uh, <clears throat> in the soil moisture estimation. So in this study, basically, uh, yeah, compares um, uh, available uh, different, uh, different machine learning techniques to estimate soil permittivity as well as uh, soil moisture using a, a simulated NICER data. So we all know the how. Uh, the importance of the soil moisture and uh, in um, many fields like hydrology, agriculture, and uh, several other ecological applications. And 
A large-scale estimation of uh, soil moisture is only possible uh, through uh, remote sensing. Uh, in, in specific, the SAR is uh, highly sensitive to the, the dielectric changes in the soil moisture, uh, the dielectric changes in the soil surface. Uh, <coughs> so the ma major objective of this study are to uh, uh, the compare and um, find out the best, uh, uh, best performing uh, uh, machine learning technique and uh, to generate large scale maps using the polarimetric uh, uh, SAR data and in a preparation to the NICER uh, uh, coming up, upcoming NICER mission. <coughs> so again, the study area is located in Manitoba, Canada, so where we have extensive ground truth uh, from uh, uh, SMAPVEX campaigns, so where we have uh, 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 nearly 16 we have samples for each field, so where we have a uniform uh, fields of nearly uh, 800 meters by 800 meters. So these are like an uh, uh, ideal cases for the proper validation of uh, soil moisture uh, products at higher resolution uh, over croplands. So coming to the data used in this study, which is uh, since uh, we have uh, several uh, uh, frequency modes available with the simulated NSR. So this study uses uh, the frequency uh, uh, mode of A in uh, frequency mode of 138A. So <clears throat> with a nominal resolution of uh, 7.3 by 7.3 meters. And uh, so here we can see the availability of the simulated data products. So basically these simulated products have uh, been processed fr from the raw UV uh, observations. So <clears throat> the methodology, uh, Start with the pre-processing of the simulated uh, NICER data. So uh, first, we derive the different uh, polarimetric uh, features uh, using uh, different de 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 decompositions, such as uh, the Freeman or the model-based, as well as the eigen uh, eigen-based decompositions. Uh, <coughs> then we feed uh, the uh, polarimetric features along with the ground data. Uh, <coughs> Two different uh, several uh, machine learning or available machine learning algorithms. Such, uh, here we have uh, in this study they have tested uh, nearly seven different machine learning algorithms, and we pick, we pick up the best performing algorithm uh, for the specific to that site and the date. So as a part of this study, uh, also develops a tool to quickly just uh, check the data, on the quickly check the best performing uh, uh, machine learning algorithm for your specific test site. Uh, for the specific uh, time date. So here we can see that uh, the UI of the developed tool. So here we can pre-process the data and extract the uh, polarimetric parameters as well as, so this actually starts from, uh, this completes, uh, uh, this uh, consists of an end-to-end pipeline from uh, uh, taking the level one SLCs or MLC data and uh, to generate and validate with the ground truth information. So here, uh, at first, uh, here are the, Results uh, for, uh, in uh, over soybean crop, the soil permittivity values. So here we can see in the same order the, uh, the uh, seven different uh, uh, machine learning algorithms. So the soybean crop, uh, yeah, um, if you compare the different machine learning algorithms, uh, in this case we can clearly see that the random forest method uh, performed better uh, for, the, uh, for the soybean crop, and uh, as well as we can uh, clearly see in a higher uh, R-square, uh, which I'll be uh, sh showing the next crop. So, so if, if we compare uh, the crops in the coming slides with the soybean, so we can see a good amount of R-square, uh, which could be possibly because of um, uh, the, the dy dynamic range of the dielectric uh, uh, observations in the soybean crop. Because if we uh, clearly see that, that uh, the dielectric range is uh, so large from the 10 uh, up to 60. So coming to the dielectric estimations of the wheat crop, so here also if you see the different, uh, uh, if you uh, compare different machine learning algorithms here, so <coughs> uh, uh, the neural network actually performed uh, uh, way inferior to compare to the other uh, machine learning models, and again, the uh, random forest uh, produced uh, good results. Though in the previous presentation, we have seen uh, a simple neural network performed better, but in this specific study, so it found the random forest working better for that test case. So coming to the corn, um, if, we, uh, if we compare the corn results with the previous two crops, uh, you can clearly see the lower RMSC values because of the low dynamic range. So if you clearly see the dynamic range is ranging from uh, 3 to 15. 
<coughs> and a, a similar observation is also can be made from here. The random forest uh, model uh, performed better, and a simple uh, <coughs> a simple multilinear regression. If you see, we we do, we also have a negative correlation, which perform we didn't perform well compared to the other me methods. Similarly, we can also uh, 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 estimate uh, directly uh, the so direct soil moisture instead of soil permittivity. So we also observe a similar results of uh, higher correlations with the random forest model. Uh, however, if you see the RMSC values uh, for the soybean field, we observe a higher uh, higher RMSCs like 5% uh, in the in terms of soil moisture and uh, 8 to 9 in the, in terms of soil permittivity. Um, this could be because the soya uh, the so the soybean crop um, mostly ha will have uh, ha higher biomass as well as the uh, the crop canopy uh, is com uh, horizontally distributed and complex compared to the wheat crops so <clears throat> it is even in presented in the several uh, previous studies that uh, the issues uh, estimate in esti estimating uh, uh, soil moisture over soybean crop however we got uh, best results for the wheat crop with a uh, RMSCs uh, ranging from a uh, three to four percent with a good R, good amount of R square. Uh, similarly for the corn, oh, sorry. Okay. Similarly for the corn, we can see a similar uh, good R, uh, RMSC. However, uh, yeah, it has to be uh, one should note that uh, the RMSC uh, are kind of relative because uh, the entire dynamic range is less than. Uh, 0.3. So the RMSC of 3% uh, with a dynamic range of 0.3 is uh, moderately performed because the corn is also a high biomass crop. With a, uh, during the field campaign, uh, the actual biomass is ranging more than 5 to 6 kilo, uh, kg per meter square. Uh, uh, coming to the overall metrics of performance of the different models, um, here we can clearly see that the RMSCs are range, uh, the RMSCs in the permittivity estimations are in, in the range of 2 to 7 for the corn to the uh, soybean. And the best performing algorithm uh, for this particular case study is the random forest. So here is the spatial distribution of the permittivity and the soil moisture maps generated uh, using the tool developed uh, during this study. So, <clears throat> So uh, in an overall conclusion of the observation or the summary of the study is uh, for this uh, SMAPEX campaign data, so among the uh, compared seven different um, uh, uh, machine learning models, so the random forest seems to be uh, work better with this data set with uh, seven, uh, seven to eight polarimetric uh, parameters and with uh, RMSC ranging from point. Uh, uh, three percent to a uh, six to seven percent uh, from corn uh, from corn to soybean, uh, <clears throat> and also this needs to uh, uh, the best performance of uh, random forest could be attributed to the handling of the larger data sets, uh, more samples, and um, and also min minimum overfitting even in presence of large uh, data sets. So thank you. So if you have any questions.